Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Kojima Powered, and thank you for joining me for another High Poly Phase time lapse. This time, I'm modeling Billy Soul, who was played by the late actor Sonny Landham from the 1987 film Predator. Ah, yeah, The Predator. One of my top five favorite movies. What can I say? It was like G.I. Joe for adults. It had guns, action, mystery, pussy jokes. If you haven't seen this iconic classic, I implore you to give it a watch. And if you've seen it already, hell, you should really watch it again, really. Our Greenberg Associates pioneered a lot of original effects and brought them to the big screen, the most famous of them being the Predator's camouflage effect. Back in the 80s, I had never seen anything like it. In the movie, every squad member had his own archetype and skill set. It was a simple idea at the time, but it would later serve as a template that would inspire the imaginations of film creators and video game developers from years to come. There's so many points in this movie that I could easily get lost in a tangent, and I don't want this to turn into a movie review. So, back on topic. Billy was a lieutenant in Alan Schaefer's private military team. He was a stoic silent type and served as a tracker in Dutch's squad for many campaigns. His extensive wilderness knowledge and experience granted him a sixth sense, so to speak. His primary loadout consisted of an M16 somehow affixed to a Mossberg 500, but perhaps his most notable weapon was his Jack Crane custom 20-inch combat machete. After careful deliberation, I chose to model Billy's last stand moment. It was a potent scene for me when he stood his crown, and through action alone demonstrated that the time for running is over, and it's time to face death like a man. There's a prevailing stereotype that Native Americans are attuned to being able to sense the unseen. It didn't bother me that much because it didn't overdo it. It was more of an ambient foreshadowing that there's something out there. And it ain't no man. This video is going to be a little bit different. Because of licensing issues, this will be my first ever impromptu video with commentary. And I only hope that I can provide you with something profound or remotely entertaining to serve as background noise uh, while hopefully you're making your own art. So yeah, I guess I'll start by talking about my creative process and the creation of Billy from the Predator. Billy! Billy! Whenever starting out a piece, I typically like to capture the most recognizable moment, and once you've done that, the rest is downhill. Uh, initially, one starts out with the face, and this holds especially true if you're trying to capture the likeness of a character. And I like this because, well, I know earlier on whether or not I screwed up. So uh, typically, or at least a good habit that I started, was to draw it in 2D. To mock out a likeness in 2D, to familiarize yourself with the character, sometimes you can capture the essence of the character a lot easier in 2D than you can in 3D. And it may sound a bit ironic, but I want my 3D models to look as 2D as possible. I mean, it's a fine line to walk. I want my character to look cartoony, but I also need it to look recognizably real, but not so much that I get bogged down in realism. Realism is like a rabbit hole. Once you start, you'll never finish anything, and the only way out is to abandon the piece. And I hate leaving a job incomplete, so yeah. Maybe it's just me, but I think that likenesses are largely subjective. I mean, I can model a face exactly one-to-one -one from one angle, but as soon as I change my perspective, like, the whole illusion falls apart, and it's an exercise in tedium, so I decided to leave out a lot of the push and pull and add and subtract part of the process. I just didn't really think it was very entertaining to watch. With the torso and the rest of the body, I put down some crude shapes that lended themselves to the corresponding volume of the character. I'm a big fan of spheres that are 8x8, 12x12, or 24x24. I like organic volumes, and I use them whenever I get a chance. You can't go wrong with spheres when you're modeling organic characters. Because it was so early on, you needn't worry about the volumes being symmetrical. My goal was to get as much real estate blocked in as possible. The only thing that I was particularly worried about was cleaning up the parts of the topology that were obscenely detrimental. 
In my mind's eye, the character was going to be shirtless. I knew all along that the bare chest with the warrior's mark was going to be a major focal point. Thus, I had to take my time in modeling the anatomy of the torso. It's very important to invest time into the right parts of the piece. Sometimes I obsess over trying to get things just right. You see, human anatomy is so asymmetrical. Everything, all of the muscle groups change under the skin depending upon the position of the body. You have to keep the in pose in mind and how it affects the muscle groups. In order to execute this, I had to separate the entire anterior of the torso and model each asymmetrical muscle group individually. It was a time-consuming process, and it's never going to be perfect, so all you really can do is try to communicate the, these forms as best as you can. It was a really draining process because after I was done with the anterior, I then knew I had to model the posterior. And since that wasn't the focal point, I admit it featuring it in detail, but trust me, it's there. 2D artists don't have to worry about this. In 2D, all you have to worry about is what the viewer can see. Sometimes the artist will render the focal point of the picture and leave everything else a gesture, and it's up to you, the viewer, to fill in what they didn't draw. Sculpture is completely different, ladies and gentlemen. If you didn't model it, it ain't there, and viewers will notice that something is missing, so you always have to go that extra mile. What perturbs me is, I might want to render this piece in the future. Sometimes I utilize my 3D works into 2D compositions by way of photo bashing. It's a tragedy that I'll have to commit to a static view of a 3D model because no one will ever be able to see all the work that I've invested into this piece as a whole. But what can you do? Anyway, around this time, I was finishing up the torso section and I recall diverging into the 2D hologram that you could see of Billy in the lower left hand corner. I was hoping that I could have found a sprite of him online, but it was to no avail. It wasn't a problem making the GIF myself, in fact it was a welcome change of pace. It offered me the time that I needed to plan on how I was going to approach the pants. Some people say that muscles are harder than fabric, but <laughs> I honestly can't grasp how. Fabric is always so labor intensive. I start with the most prominent crease and work my way to the more minute folds. Remember, like muscle groups, you have to keep the end pose in mind and how that future pose might affect the flow of the fabric. Whoever said practice makes perfect never modeled fabric before. Practice makes improvement. At very best, practice makes it'll have to do. Since fabric has just as much capacity to be a time sink as anatomy, I'm open to any unorthodox approach to tackling it. With that said, I must confess I cheated a bit. Let this be our little secret between you, me, and the internet. If you're pressed for time, run a cloth solver on your fabric to get a crinkle, and then use that crinkle to build off of. It's quick and dirty, but it gets the job done. It may take a couple of tries to achieve the desired result, and if it's not solving the way you want, you might need to add more geometry into areas you want to get more detail. The process is more or less the same song and dance, really. The only thing I'm concerned with is cleaning up the obscene areas in the mesh, simulating the cloth, modifying the results, simulating the cloth again. If it's good, keep it. If not, control Z. It's drone work, really, but it's necessary work nonetheless. In a strange way, I find this tedious cycle of meticulous exactitude kind of cathartic. It helps me organize my thoughts. Speaking of thoughts, I can't help but question, what the heck was I thinking? I mean, I've invested a whole lot of time into the crotch section for so little payoff. I mean, I've been modeling this part for five minutes now. <laughs> the crotch must be perfect. <laughs> Serious though, all jokes aside, it's more productive to render the entire piece as a whole with equal attention. However, this rule gets somewhat more complicated when you're making time lapses. It's supposed to be entertaining and informative. The audience has to be able to visually recognize what you're modeling within the first 30 seconds, or they'll lose interest. The only reason I'm modeling it this way is I can inspire more people if I make it look easy. All in the name of showmanship. The boots demanded the least amount of attention. You have to keep in mind the impose and allocate detail accordingly. 
In my mind's eye, I could see the contrapasta of the character posed in the way that he was just about to step forward. So my main concern was working on the ankle and the ball of the foot. I wanted to give it that flexed leather look. I laced the boots, but I omitted the bow at the top. I thought it wasn't high priority. The project was so near completion, and I was thinking about the combat machete. After researching, I found out that it was custom made for the movie, and it didn't become official until after Sunny Landham died, as a tribute, I suppose. They price around $850. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but aren't you supposed to give tributes instead of market them? Anyways, I digress. The knife was simple to pop out. It's a symmetrical shape that I found myself focusing most of my time on the efficiency of the topology and the detail on the grip. I threw in a couple of curves in the blade because I wanted it to catch light in an aesthetically pleasing way. I knew it was going to be the second crucial focal point, so I scaled it up a bit. You can chalk it up to artistic license. Scale is one part of many when it comes to conveying a narrative, and uh, oh, before I forget, this might warrant a separate video, but I'd like to briefly touch on how not just character design, but also typecasting played an important role in storytelling. Predator 1987 had so many hard-hitting actors, all in their prime. Arnold Schwarzenegger, Carl Weathers, Bill Duke, Jesse the Body, Ventura, and the rest. All worked harmoniously because they were so unique in their own right. They all offered what someone else lacked. Together, they didn't compete against each other. Instead, they completed each other as a whole. The environment also plays a big part in the believability of the characters. I can still watch the film to this day and notice new things. All the characters camouflaged so well. It feels like they belong there. Because of that, I regret not modeling in the background. It's a missed opportunity, one that only could have strengthened the piece. I was pressed for time, and I really need to get this time lapse behind me. It's important to keep productive and not to fixate on any one thing for too long. One thing worthy of noting that I didn't feature was... I went through a lot of trial and error with the hair. At the end, I settled on three different versions, and after careful deliberation, I ended up combining the best parts of each iteration into my finished product. So yeah, that covers just about everything I wanted to touch on. Except for my characters in T-Pose. Although it's a good likeness, it's not conveying anything special. It lacks personality in its current state. There's a gin sequa to what I'm trying to describe. As an artist, I wanted to capture in a bottle something intangible. I needed to capture the soul of the moment. And how does one accomplish this? Well, the answer is, I needed my model to tell a story without moving. And that requires the perfect mixture of narrative, positioning, focal points, and lighting. You only get one shot at it. Fortunately, the theory is exactly the same for 3D as it is for 2D. So, I'll explain how I approached it. Since this was a tribute piece to the late actor at heart, I wanted something stoic and subtle, but I also wanted it to be a confrontational piece. Let's face it, Sonny Landon was a confrontational guy. So, when posing the character, I wanted to give my viewers something to question. Who is this person brandishing a knife? He looks like an Indian brave with that war paint. He's wearing part of a uniform but something doesn't add up. Why is he alone? There's a warrior's mark on his chest, and I only see one blade. Notice his expression and how he's looking up. These are subtle clues you want to give the viewer that whatever unseen thing he's waiting for is greater than himself. You also want to communicate through body language. Notice the subtlety of his lean towards the unseen force. All in all, I think you could see what I was going for. Looking at this piece now, I can see that I forgot two little details. Billy was wearing a wristband, and he had a medicine bag clenched in his fist with a knife. Yeah. Anyway, I think I did a good job in capturing Billy's last stand moment, and I'd like to think that Sonny Landon would deem it a worthy tribute. With that said, I'll leave you, and let the rest of the video dance as it may.